Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Can everybody hear me? Yes, yes. good. Now, <clears throat> some of you have been fortunate or unfortunate, as the case may be, to be landed with four maps, but um, they are of some interest. Um, and I'll just show you what they are. They're not actually in, in the right order. So we go to number two first. It says Map 5, Administrative Divisions in Ottoman Armenia after 1878. Now what we're seeing there is Turkish Armenia. Um, the eastern provinces of Turkey, which were then the Armenian provinces of Turkey, quite often referred to as Western Armenia. Now, to the east you see Transcaucasia. Well, Transcaucasia covers where um, Eastern Armenia was, which was under Tsarist rule, under Russian rule. And so what it comes to is this. The Armenian nation was divided, as it were, not quite in half, but nearly so, by the boundary which had been drawn up between Russia and the Ottoman Empire in 1878. And we're going to look at both sides of that boundary today, but principally the Turkish side of the boundary. The Armenian villages between Sebastia and Zara. Well, now, Sebastia was the Armenian name for Shivas. And it was in the valley going east on Shivas that there were a whole concentration of Armenian villages. And towards the right, you see a small town called Zara. Now, that's where the Balumian family originated. Now, the other two maps we can put to one side at this stage. Well, I've got one or two um, acknowledgements to make. Um, obviously, I'm full of praise for my son, who let me t t tell you a secret. He's going to be 40 tomorrow. <laughs> and um, he showed a, some very good sense in... Um, deciding to get married to a Lebanese girl. And here she is, Noor, who's um, been um, helping me through all the pitfalls of uh, high tech, um, which really I'm not up to at all. <laughs> now, I've had help from a number of other sources. Um, the head of the Bloss Lynch family, Major Bl Henry Bloss Lynch, who um, gave me a lot of material from his private papers, but above all, from the Balumian family. They've been sending in emails from far and wide um, telling me about the past of their family. And I'm delighted to be able to tell you that a great-grandson, Rafi, is here tonight. He's come to be with us from Yerevan, and he's going to play his oud for you after you've finished with me. But I think what I'd really like to do is to dedicate this lecture to the Balumian family. Remembering, of course, Mardiros Balumian. There's a memorial to his parents in the church of St. Nikan here. So we'll remember them and we'll remember all his children and his grandchildren and his at least one great-grandchild. So I dedicate this lecture to them. Now I'm going to introduce to you two gentlemen. The first one you might think the absolutely epitome of an English country gentleman, and there he is, about to go off hunting, um, standing in his rose garden in a village in, uh, near Oxford. And that's Henry Finnis Bloss Lynch, who was born in 1862 and died in 1913. He was a Londoner by birth, but in response to growing concerns about what was happening to Armenians in eastern Turkey, 
and what the international implications might be. He traveled in Eastern Armenia, and um, he also traveled in Turkish Armenia. And then, when he came back in 1901, brought out his famous books called Armenia Travels and Studies. Please know. They're the volumes. Um, if you wanted those in good condition now, you'd have to pay about two and a half thousand pounds for you. But in the first place, they didn't sell very well at all. He also prepared a map of Armenia, which is under that cloth and which you'll be able to see afterwards. Now, later on, Lynch became the chairman of his family business, which was based in Baghdad and Basra. This was an import-export business, which also ran a steamship company on the Tigris. And Lynch's lasting achievement, uh, apart from his uh, books on Armenia, was linked to his work in Mesopotamia in the Persian Gulf, where not only did he run the steamship company going up and down from Baghdad to Basra, but he also opened up navigation on the Karun River, which also flows into the um, uh, Shat al Arab, and built a road from the Karun River to Isfahan over the Zagros Mountains. He was also a liberal member of parliament for four years. Um, he was a radical. He was a persistent critic of the foreign policy of Sir Edward Grey, the um, uh, British Foreign Secretary, particularly towards the Ottoman Empire and an independent Persia. Now we come to the modest hero of my lecture. He, curiously enough, um, was also a road builder but in Lebanon and Syria. Madiros Boulemian was born in 1895 and died in 1983. He owned the house we are in. In the course of his long life, he was a victim of the Armenian Holocaust of 1915 and he narrowly escaped death. He knew scenes of the utmost horror and degradation as he wrote in an article seeking justice for and recognition for the ordeal of his people, towards the end of his life, he wrote in this pamphlet, for over 60 years now, since 1915, these bloodthirsty brutalities and acts of vandalism, which I have witnessed during the extermination of my own family and my compatriots, haunt me like a terrifying nightmare day and night, and have not given me a moment's peace in my life. Now, one can well understand his private feelings, but he was able to build a remarkable, successful career as a road builder. That's his delightful wife, who he met in Constantinople and brought to Lebanon and um, lived here, of course, together. Had a long and happy marriage here. Seven daughters and one son. The son, Barrowet, is still alive and living in New York. And I can tell you this from what I've been told by the family, that Madaros was a very charitable, cultured, scholarly, and devout. From now on, I shall refer to these two gentlemen as Harry and Madaros. And you'll be asking yourself, what on earth have they got to do with each other? Well, of course, they never did meet. And Lynch died before the Holocaust of 1915. He died in 1913. But in some curious way, their lives were interlinked. I've already alluded to their involvement in road building. Marderos's family home at Zara in the Vilayet which you've seen on the map I showed you, Sivas, Sebastia, was very close to the expeditions that Harry made, although he never actually went there. 
But what Harry did do was to bring to the notice of the West the Turkish Armenians were essentially a rural, agricultural, peaceful people who, if only given equal rights and sound administration and protection from Kurdish raids, would shine in many aspects of life, such as the learned professions, business, and in the present day, the internet, quite apart from having a number of musicians among them. It follows, therefore, that Marduras and his married many descendants are and were living proof that Harry Lynch was right about the Armenian race. But what drove Harry to go to the Armenian lands, and what may have been the origins of his undoubted sense of affinity with the people? Now, to answer these questions, we shall have to look at his background, his upbringing, and his undoubted intellectual gifts. Harry was the only son of Thomas Lynch, one of 11 sons of an Irish soldier and landowner from County Mayo, which was on the extreme west coast of Ireland. Thomas Lynch, yes, was one of 11 sons, and six of them were involved in one way or another in what is known as the Euphrates Expedition. The eldest, Lieutenant Henry Bloss Lynch of the Bombay Navy, and an expert in steam navigation, was second in command. In 1835, this expedition landed two steam paddle boats on parts of the Mediterranean coast near Antioch, hauled them across the desert to Biricek on the Euphrates, where they were assembled and launched. One capsized and sank with loss of life, the other achieved the near impossible, steamed down to the Shat el Arab and then up the Tigris to Baghdad. The purpose was to exploit the possibility of a shorter land route from the Mediterranean to India via Syria, Mesopotamia and the Persian Gulf. But what, in fact, the expedition did do because it was not successful in establishing that, um, was to introduce Henry and his younger brother Thomas, who was Harry Lynch's father, to the daughters of Colonel Robert Taylor, yes, who was the East India Company's agent and consul in Baghdad. Now, the brothers duly married Taylor's daughters, Caroline and Harriet. But these apparently very beautiful girls were not quite what you might expect, because their mother was an Armenian from Shiraz. And that, and, and they'd grown up in an Oriental style in the consulate at Baghdad with Persian and Armenian as their first languages. Now, when Harry was growing up, his Armenian grandmother, Rosa, lived in the same house. By then, she was an elderly widow and blind who would tell her children, sit her children on her lap, and tell them tales of when she was the colonel's lady in Baghdad. Harry knew, for example, that she had eloped at the age of 12 with his grandfather, who was then aged 19, and in charge of the British Guard on the embassy in Bushire. I meant consulate. And when, on her way to join her husband, Wahhabi pirates had captured her, held her to ransom in Bahrain, and stolen her jewellery, which she later turned up um, in the Baghdad Bazaar and bought it back again. Now, this old lady, with her hennaed hands, and a scent of attar of roses and a heavily accented English was one of the first influences which uh, drew Harry to the east and particularly to Armenia. Now the Euphrates expedition may have achieved nothing, but it suggested to Henry Thomas and their younger brother Stephen the possibility of a lucrative trading business. 
So Lynch Brothers was formed based on Baghdad. Starting in 1840, by 1860, all three were rich men, exporting wool, wheat, dates, cotton, and horses, and importing sheep good and, good, and goods from India and um, Manchester. To set up a means of efficient river transport, they established the Euphrates and Tigris Steam Navigation Company, which carried goods and passengers up and down the Tigris to the sea, subject to a firman from the Ottoman Sultan. Now, Thomas and Stephen, Thomas's brother, settled their families in Cleveland Square. That's Cleveland Square in Bayswater. When those houses were being built in the 19th century, the whole area was nicknamed Asia Minor because it was much favored by people who were connected with the Orient. Now this, the Armenian connection um, becomes greater because his uncle Stephen had also married an Armenian girl in Baghdad. And so there you have these two families very closely linked with a strong Armenian influence in both of them facing each other across Cleveland Square. Harry was educated at Eton, Trinity College, Cambridge, where he gained a first in classics, became secretary of the Union Society, and won a blue at polo. It's possible to trace the development of his political views because the records of debates in which he took part at Cambridge still exist. Among other things, he supported, contrary to his family's view, home rule for Ireland, and it is not difficult to see how that approach developed sympathy for other oppressed peoples like the Armenians. Harry was destined in due course to run the family business. And in 1891, he became deputy chairman of the Tigris Navigation Company. But by that time, he was developing an interest in the Eastern question, mindful of fact, the fact that the Congress of Berlin, the Ottoman Sultan, had undertaken to promote reform in the Armenian provinces and had not only done nothing about it, but no effective measures had been taken by the Western powers to get him to do anything about it. That was because, as we know, the Ottoman Empire was about to disintegrate. The Western powers all had their eyes on one part of it or another, as here. And, um, and um, they were all arguing and all um, accusing each other of trying to infiltrate in a particular place. And of course, Sultan Abdul Hamid II simply played them all off against each other or provide them with reform. In 1893, in Shivas and adjoining areas, graffiti started appearing on walls all over the place particularly connected with the American Evangelical College at Marsavan. These graffiti were written in Turkish and they were universally insulting to the, to the Sultan. What happened next was that hundreds of Armenians were arrested and after summary trial, many of them were sentenced to death. There was then massive intervention from the West, and only five of them were eventually executed. But it was at that point that Harry Lynch decided to go and see for himself. His prime impetus was therefore hum humanitarian. But it must be not be forgotten that Harry was not only a radical liberal, but he was also an imperialist. And in common with others, he was concerned that Tsarist Russia was looking for a reason to justify occupation of Turkish Armenia and that the present disturbances might provide it. This was the area of the so-called Great Game, 
A Russian base in eastern Turkey, it was thought, would provide an ideal launching pad into Mesopotamia and the Persian Gulf, threatening British imperial and commercial interests, including, of course, Harry Lynch's. And it should not be forgotten that Harry Lynch was a seasoned traveler in the East already and was now looking for another opportunity to explore rough and wild places and in particular to climb Mount Ararat. Harry, his cousin, who was a captain in the army, set out to Constantinople in August 1893, where they were joined by a Swiss mountaineer whose contract included a clause to provide two gentlemen with equipment to climb a snow mountain. Um, and a young ph ph photographic assistant from London to help with Harry's photography. And he took many a photograph, and his photographs constitute the greatest memorial, as it were, to life in both Russian and Turkish Armenia before the blows fell. He was also accompanied, because he couldn't speak Armenian or Turkish, by what was known as a dragoman or interpreter, a fat little Armenian called Boyajian who kept on falling off his horse and getting to all sorts of scrapes. Later, he was described by Graves, the British consul at Erzurum, as the biggest damn fool he'd ever met. Now, to read of Harry's extraordinary travels in Russia and Turkish Armenia in detail, you will have to get his book, because there are much cheaper editions on the market now. So um, I will deal with his travels in short form and draw on his diaries, which are in the National Museum Archives in Yerevan. Now, Eastern Armenia was recognized as being a peaceful state under Russian protection, but um, which, as the um, Catholicos, Crimean, described as the land which time forgot. And um, what Harry was concerned to find out is whether the Russians were busy undermining Armenian culture by um, uh, relegating the apostolic church and its education and replacing it with Russian education. And he, and he found out by visiting schools and religious establishments um, that yes, um, that was the case. And at the same time, the number of uh, evangelical missions in the country were also having the same effect in another direction. But Harry was also looking for signs of Russian military activity which could be described as belligerent. He found none. He found none because the Russian forces had been largely moved up to Finland and Poland because unrest was threatened there. The only time he came into contact with the Russian military was on the ascent of Ararat, when he and his party were given a guard of Cossacks. The night before the ascent, they all bivouacked on the mountainside together. Harry liked the Colonel of Cossacks, a bluff, rough and ready, but generous man. But to his horror, he found that the Lieutenant, um, a St. Petersburg aristocrat, had his bivouac full of scent bottles and portraits of fashionable Russian ladies. But they all ate together cold partridge, vodka, bread, while the Cossack soldiers sang in the distance. And the following day, Harry and his cousin and the Swiss mountaineer ascended Ararat. No, Ararat. Here we are. I took these photographs. Thank you very much, Toy. I took these photographs. That one shows Ararat from the Turkish side. It's the other side they climb. Now the next one, Noor, please. On the Armenian side, Ararat appears with two peaks, and they claim the higher of the, they 
climbed the higher of the two in September 1893, which is exactly the month of September that I took that photograph. Now, it was really, I think, in the climb of Ararat that he started to gain a close affinity with his mother's forebears. Ararat, of course, as we know, is a mountain of immense significance to Armenians, in spite of the fact the whole of it stands in Turkey these days. But what I'm going to do is to read out a passage of his diary which shows the effect that the mountain cast on him. As you return, the evening draws in. You see on your left the mud houses of the Tartar villages and the green clumps of trees. You, start the more, you skirt the more primitive Kurdish village and the pool where the barefoot Kurdish girls are drawing water. You pass through bouquets of white and pink heather. A flora of great variety starts from among the stones and surprises you by its beauty. The sun sinks behind quiet gray clouds. The blue zenith pales and fades. The full moon rises from the gray clouds and lights the whole landscape. A heavy quiet reigns. All is vast and still and lonely and immense. The cicada hums. The low dark line of the trees of Arilic is unseen until you were upon it a mere shadow on the plain. It is an awesome scene, and the great religious feelings of man must have taken origin here. Having written that passage, Harry immediately turns into the impatient, impatient Englishman abroad, because the next entry is, no dinner when we return, Russian hours. The other thing about that passage is its reference to barefoot village girls. And Harry seems to have been rather obsessed by them in his travels because he took a number of photographs of barefoot village girls as he went round Russia and Turkey. And here is one of them who he described as a strapping village wench um, from a village near Mush. Now, the next thing that um, Harry did, and the only other thing I shall mention in Armenia, Russian Armenia, is that he was a visitor and attended dinners and was received by Mekhadi Krimian, the great um, Armenian patriarch. He was present as his enthronement, and he took a number of photographs of it. In fact... There he is, the, the, the um, patriarch, um, and um, for, taken by Harry, who later hung that photograph up in his library in England. Now, he also photographed the ceremony itself. Now, that's curious in a way, and I'll tell you why in a moment. Harry was actually in quite a bad mood throughout the whole time there. He confided in his diaries how I hate ceremony. He didn't like the buildings. He didn't like the greedy habits of the Armenian priests. He didn't like the way that the ancient books were laid out on a table and could be fingered by everybody. And his particular disappointment came with the ladies. He'd expected the ladies, particularly from Tiflis, to come in their Armenian national attire and was intensely disappointed to discover they were all dressed in the latest Paris fashions. <laughs> now, now I'll tell you there's something of a mystery about this picture. Um, we know that um, he took four shots on glass plates. One of them, no five, one of them is in the Royal Geographical Society in London, another's in the Courtauld Institute, another give, was given as a wedding present to Lord Curzon, um, and um, there's the one which was found in a flea market in Paris, a glass plate, which that one is developed from. Now the fifth one 
is in the museum at Antelias. And I've thought a lot about how it got there. And I couldn't find any answers at all. I suspect it's either Harry's own that in the 1920s, his friend Petros Tonopetian, who dispersed a lot of his property, gave to the Patriarchate here. Or else it might have hung in Yerevan and might have been uh, removed in time of war and brought here, perhaps by people who were trying to save what they had. But I don't know, but it might be quite an interesting idea to look into that. Now, winter was arriving when Harry crossed the frontier. The terrain was of concern because it would tell him about how Russian troop movements could progress through Turkey into Mesopotamia. But above all, he wanted to assess the position of the Armenian population and its suffering. And this, he concluded, was the result of bad and corrupt administration, inequality before the law, onerous taxation, and lack of protection against predatory Kurdish tribes, and the activities of a makeshift cavalry called the Hamidie Cavalry, which were sent there to keep law and order, and as a rule joined in with the Kurds in raiding the Armenians. He was also, again, interested in the influence of the church, which he found to be persecuted, but at the same time, he found that in many ways it suppressed knowledge and was obscurantist and kept people down. And also the state of education, which apart from privately funded establishments and the American mission schools left much to be desired. His journey took him to Van Bitlis, Mush and Erzurum, where he stayed for three months with the British consul, Robert Wyndham Graves. These are more, these are more of Etchmiadzin, um, taken. The top one was taken by Lynch in 1893, bottom one by me in 2003, and now over, over, next one. Here we have um, the, the Armenian, the, the, well, of course in Soviet Union then, relatives of Maduros, who went over to see them, again at Ejmiatsin. Right, now we'll move on again then. What year was those children? The ones, that one, that was taken, I would think, in, in the 60s, when it was still a communist country. If you went there now, that's Noravank actually. The place is absolutely filled with people priests everywhere, and there's a sacrificial pit at the back of the church where brown woolly lambs are sacrificed as an act of thanksgiving. It appears, but that's, it like the dates are there. It's what, what does it say? Gegheart, is it? Gegard, yes, it's the other name for Nora Vank, I think. Yes, okay, well, we'll move on. And um, yes, we have graves. That's the British. I thought I'd produce a sort of joke photograph of Robert Wyndham Graves. Robert Wyndham Graves was a great supporter of the Armenian cause, and he alerted the West to the, to the, um, to the massacres at Sassoon. But he was at the consul in Albania then, and he decided to pose in Albanian national dress for that photograph. Right. And Lynch stayed with him for um, two or three months. On the way to Graves at Erzurum, he went through Mush and Bitlis, where he found an evil atmosphere in the air, and it was in a nearby village called Sassoon that the first of the massacres of 1895 took place, sparked off because the Armenian villagers decided to make a fight of it over double taxation and Kurdish raids. 
Now, it was while those massacres against, while, yes, and then the massacres which started at Sassoon turned into a bloodbath all over Turkey. It was while these massacres were going on that Marderos was born. In Erzurum, Harry and Graves worked out Harry's solution to the problem. What he proposed was an area which would be in the an Armenian zone, as it were, ruled rather like Mount Lebanon was, and surrounded with mountains. And his idea set out in this one, which is, which is um, Lynch's, um, Lynch's suggestion, which was not only rejected by the Foreign Office, but it was also rejected by the Armenians in France and England, who said that it was cloud cuckoo land, and um, what um, was really, really needed was the Alexander of the North, in other words, the Tsar, and the scythe of the Armenian peasant. You will see afterwards that Harry eventually drew up a map of his own, but the province of Shivas he, misses, he missed out, because the, the Armenians only numbered about one in five of the population, and it was the wrong side of his, his um, mountain barrier. Now, when he got back, he um, obviously had unique knowledge of the um, Armenian question, but he'd had one further contact in Erzurum, which made a deep impression on him him because he stayed with an Armenian family that was not unlike his own family in London. Can... Yeah. Next one please. That. Now that's the Salukian family. Mr. S I mean, the, he and the, and the father, who I don't think he's there, was the head, one of the headmasters of the Sanasarian school in Erzurum. The lady on the left, the young lady on the left, um, Lynch, you know, she wasn't a barefooted village girl, but he fell for her. He took five photographs of her in national costume. He thought she was very conceited. He was amazed that she was only 18 and already had two children. He thought she was charming. Unfortunately, the photographs that he took of her alone have been lost. Um, and he um, deplored the furniture, which he thought was in the worst European style, but he thought the carpets, and you can see one there, were magnificent. Well, after that, he worked at trying to get recognition um, for his schemes, but they were not accepted, and then he went back, became chairman of his companies, and got involved in the world of commerce once more. Well, we'll leave him, we'll leave him and we'll come to Marderos. We remember he'd just been born. And we're going to look at a life's journey here, which started off in a little town in a remote mountain valley in eastern Turkey and ended in this very house. Now, can we have the photograph of Zara, please? There's Zara today. That's where he was born. And, and um, it gives a good idea of the terrain to this day. It's a story. No, before we get on that, we'll just look at another of these plans because you can see it on the map. Um, the, last of the, the last of the maps, which is the district. You can see Shivas on the left, and you can see Zara on the right. And in between the two, there are a number of villages which all sit in a wide mountain valley down which a river runs called the Halis, or it's got a modern Turkish name. Now, this is a story of great endurance in the face of shocking violence and cruelty which becomes an inspiring account of rising above it. We notice what his descendants are doing all around the world today. Medicine, the law, academic, 
the arts, computer science, and more besides, in many countries. I've already remarked on the help that they've all given me. I've been able to piece together his life um, after the First World War. But um, as for the time when he was growing up in Zara, um, I'm trying to piece things together. Unfortunately, a book was written about village life in a nearby village called Govdun at the same time. So I can illustrate what I'm saying with pictures of the people who lived around that area in Govdun, who are always probably exactly similar to those in Zara, except the where Zara was a mixed Turkish and Armenian town. These villages were all Armenian. Here are some, here are the, here are some pictures of ordinary people from Govdun, taken about the time that Madiros was born. And one guesses that he, you know, like that. And there's schoolboys. And then there's one more photograph. And there's um, another group. I've relied heavily on this account on Govdon to try and describe to you what it must have been like. Zara lies in the fertile valley of the river Halis, Kizilurmak, edged by high mountains on both sides, comparable in height to Mount Lebanon. The sweltering summer heat gives way to bitter winters, deep in snow. In the year of Madaros's birth, it had a mixed Ar Armenian and Turkish population, but the valley was predominantly Armenian. In Govdun, the houses were divided into living quarters, barn, storage area, and sheepfold, with roofs covered in some depth with earth. And this may well be true of Zara as well. The occupants were in the main poor agricultural peasants, but the Balumian family seemed to be a cut well above, for his parents were well-to-do, earning substantial tracts of land in mountain pasture and fertile valley. Agriculture was a principal concern, for they owned 200 head of cattle and calves, flocks of sheep and horses. As he grew, Mardi Ross would uh, help, these, help with these. Now, I've often wondered, since Zara was on a through road, whether the family might not have indulged in trade as well, because Madiros, as we know, was a substantial entrepreneur. Like everyone else, their lives were closely bound up with the passage of the seasons. When deep snow melted in the village and on the mountain sides, and when the oxen, out went the oxen and the wooden ploughs, followed by the seeding of the land. In early summer, the herds and flocks were driven up to the mountain pastures, and we can imagine young Madiros and his younger brothers taking part. In high summer, the women folk would go out to the fields and orchards, picking cherries, peaches, figs, apricots, and all sorts of greens. And at harvest time, under the burning sun, men and women together would scythe the ripened wheat. Back in the village, everyone would join in to winnow and to thresh. People sang as they worked, collecting their share of grain to the sound of the davul, which is a sort of drum, and the zuma, zona, a flute. Winter, with the villages isolated by roads, blocked by deep snow, was spent indoors. We can imagine Madaros, his four brothers, his mother Alma, and his father Sogoman, with perhaps elder members of the family, around the family hearth, while they, like countless others, got on with their daily work, preparing and storing winter supplies, weaving, spinning, and baking. The church exercised a profound influence. The priest had a very important role. People were devout, and in addition to answering spiritual needs, the priest might be the only provider of education. And the principal feast days of the church, pilgrimages and the like, also provided 
opportunities for holidaying, parties and celebrities. People were very good at that, with dancing, wine and music. It is obvious from sheet music found here. And what I liked about one of those pieces of sheet music was that it was a sonata by Beethoven, and I can't think of a composer who can better express uh, the heroism and the pathos and the eventual triumph of this family. I wondered um, where was his music, his passion for music formed? And I have to put it back when he was a young lad listening to the village musicians and the dances and so forth. There was so much part of his life. However, this settled enclosed community had shortcomings within and enemies without. I've asked Marderas's family about their father's formal education. They believe it was rudim rudimentary. State education, and Harry Lynch tells us that, was confined to the larger towns and was suitable for Muslims only. Schools for Armenian boys and girls were also in the larger towns and were provided by benefactors, lay or ecclesiastical. There was a growing number of schools and colleges of a high standard run by American missionaries. These provided a growing number of teachers and nurses, but their evangelical message was not acceptable to many Armenians. We know there was a mission station in Zara, an offshoot of the American college in Shivas, which might have employed a teacher from Harry Lynch's findings, it is very doubtful if any state education existed. But of course, the priesthood may have done what they could. My guess is that Marduros got what education he had from the church, from his parents, and possibly from an American missionary. I should add that after 1908, a local lad who became a, a famous Dashnak, eventually dying at the siege of Baku, a man called Sebastati Murad used to hold discussion groups in the villages which served the purpose of opening up the outside world to them. Back to 1895, the year that Marduros was born, and it was also the year that hatred and violence run through the six province, ran through the six provinces. We remember that Harry Lynch witnessed the preliminaries at Sassoon, we recall the Yafta incidents of 1893, closely involving Shivas. It was on the 12th of November, 1895, that 1,500 Armenians were killed in Shivas and their properties destroyed. What is more, violence spread up the valleys and certainly re reached Zorasar, but mercifully, Zara seems to have been spared. By the end of the year, the storm seems to have blown itself out. But from then onwards, fear of repetition must never have gone from the villagers' minds. In 1908, hopes were raised because Abdul Hamid abdicated and it was thought that the coming of the CUP, the Young Turks, and the restoration of the Constitution would have a better effect but optimism was quickly, quickly dispelled by an appalling massacre of Armenians in Adana. We now come to late 1913. Marduras has reached his late teens, and as far as we know, still living with his parents. Life on the surface was peaceful and had been for some years. Indeed, hopes must have been raised for a second time because the Ottoman Empire and Russia came to an agreement to provide the Armenian provinces with a semi-autonomous region governed in a similar way to Mount Lebanon. And to that end, two high commissioners were appointed, one for the three northern and one for the three southern provinces. A Norwegian colonel called Hoff was to um, administer the north 
and a gentleman called Westerneck from the Dutch East Indies, now Indonesia, was to um, provide government for the Southern Three. But of course, it never took place because the Great War broke out very shortly afterwards. 1913 would prove to be Harry Lynch's last. Since the publication of Armenia Travels and Studies, Harry had devoted himself to the expansion of his oriental business interests. In addition to his existing operations in Baghdad and on the Tigris, he'd instigated steam navigation on the Karun as an arm of his commercial interests in Persia. His firm had built the Bakhtiari Road over the mountains and he hoped to build railways there. But he'd been a radical MP from 1906 to 1910, constantly attacking the government's policy on Eastern affairs and supporting the nationalists in Persia. He made no secret of the fact that he held the foreign office in contempt. He thought that it was spineless and ignorant of commercial affairs. This hostility was returned. The Foreign Office couldn't stand him either. Now it so happened that also in 1913, Germany and Britain reached agreement on commercial rivalry in the Ottoman Empire. Germany was to be dominant in railway building. Britain was to have a monopoly of navigation on the Tigris. But unfortunately for Harry, the concession was taken from his hands behind his back by the Foreign Office and placed in the hands of a rival. He therefore travelled to Constantinople, got there in November 1913, tried to bribe Ottoman ministers to grant the concession back to him. He was watched all the way. He left Constantinople in good health, but without obtaining his objective. By the time he reached Calais, he was ill. Ten days later, he died in a hotel there. His friends suspected foul play. No inquest was ever held. The note on the Foreign Office file is simply, quel dénouement. Nine months later, the world was at war. And in December 1914, an ill-advised Ottoman offensive into the Caucasus was routed by the Russian army at the Battle of Sarikamis. By the spring of 1915, the huge Tsarist army, enhanced by several Armenian brigades, was rumbling westwards. In anticipation, the Armenians of Van rose up against the Turks, held the city for six weeks, and welcomed the Russians in. This may have been the catalyst for the reign of terror, which then exploded. Under the excuse of military necessity, General Mehmet Kemal, the commander of the Third Army, whose duty it was to defend the six Armenian provinces, organized the wholesale massacre, uprooting and deportation of the Armenian population. At the same time, warning the Muslim population that anyone caught helping Armenians would be hanged outside their front doors. In the Vilayet or province of Shivas, massacres and expulsions began in mid-July 1915. By the end of 1915, of 160,000 Armenians, only 10,000 remained in the province. Those who survived death, slavery, or forced conversion were marched over the mountains and across the Syrian desert to pestilential camps at Raqqa and Deir Ezzor. And if you look at the last map on our one with a lot of routes on it, that shows the various routes taken by the Armenians as they were herded across the frontier, well not the frontier, herded into Syria. Now many died on the march or in, or in the camps. Mardiros, having lost his parents and two brothers, came close to death on more than one occasion. After a period of slavery to occurred, he too was sent on the long march to Raqqa, 
where he endured unspeakable horrors and cruelty and witnessed many more. One of his tasks was to bury the dead. In the autumn of 1918, the Ottoman Empire collapsed. Marduros walked from the camp. One of his first acts was to beg for bread from a Turkish family. Many years later, as a prosperous citizen, he returned to reward them for their kindness. He had stepped out into a world which would soon take on a completely new shape, the mandated territories of Syria and Lebanon. But at that stage, the Levant was in a very poor shape. This was largely a largely undeveloped area which had suffered from famine and starvation. The silk industry had collapsed, but there was already a small Armenian presence there. The last governor of Mount Lebanon had in fact been an Armenian. And Sheriff Hussein of Mecca had issued an edict quoting the Quran, requesting the protection and support of Armenians driven out into the desert. And so, by and large, those 96,000 Armenian refugees who settled in the Levant were well received. Marduros was one of those refugees. At first, he does not seem to have settled. We know he met his future wife in Constantinople on his way to Athens, and that his son Baroir, who has given me so much help, was born in Alexandretta in 1925. But then he got a job in Latakia and never looked back. We may reflect that until he gained his freedom, we're talking about a country lad who'd had hardly any education, had probably never seen a big city, and certainly not the sea, or worked in one. We find him living in one room with no sanitation, studying French and Arabic by the light of an oil lamp at night and working by day as a supervisor with the Société des Asphalt de Latakia. His breakthrough followed when he was appointed the company's agent for Syria and Lebanon. There was a big demand for roads and Marduros seized his opportunity. He became a leading contractor in particular in the Bechari district, and was also responsible for the surrounds of the St. George's Hotel. God help him if he could see it now. By 1960, he was living with his wife, son, and seven daughters in this house. As Remy Feigali wrote, reading how big and successful the Balumian family has become makes me very happy and hopeful that no tyranny can ever win over goodness and hope. Emails I've had from his surviving children and grandchildren paint a picture of a happy, comfortable home where music and the arts flourished and lots of partying, dancing and various events. They also tell me of many charitable acts, how their father placed a memorial to his parents in the church of San Nican, and also that he repaired the roofs of both Christian and Muslim places of worship without charge. There were poignant moments too. Once a year, the survivors from Zara and Shivas used to meet here for dinner together and whilst they spoke about and came to terms with memories in quiet voices, their children would play around them. At about the same time that the Balumians moved here, Marduros, now with his son, expanded his business interests. They acquired a franchise to run duty-free shops at Beirut Airport, and when the franchise was not renewed in 1965, they opened up Carousel, which sold similar products. And here is a strange coincidence. Kayats, the publishers in Rue Bliss in Beirut, in that year 
brought out the first reprint of Harry Lynch's Armenia Travels and Studies. One wonders if um, <coughs> Marduras had a copy of it. But storm clouds were gathering yet again, and we know what they were. Madaros had regained the duty-free franchise, but when war came, his shops were plundered. The family dispersed, but Madaros stayed on. One day he was driving to the airport with his son when the car was hit by a fusillade of gunfire. Barrier, the son, was severely wounded, but Madaros miraculously escaped unscathed. One can imagine how he suffered when his only son was not expected to survive. But Madaros was not to be easily dislodged. He stayed on into the worst years of the war, passing away on a visit to his sister in June 1983. Now, we'll see for the passport. Ah, first of all, the passports. These are passports which were found here, which show what a very wide traveler he, were, he was. The Gulf states, West Africa, for example, and there were many more. And now finally, um, to the house when he last lived here. That's it. That was taken when he died. One of his last acts was to write an impassioned plea to the United Nations, and I have a copy here if anybody wants to see it, seeking official recognition of the disasters that befell his countrymen in 1915, and which he, in magnificent style, overcame. Thank you.